Uh, so tonight, you know, even though I, uh, I'm, I run a startup, this is not at all a sales pitch. I wanted to keep the talk technical, uh, you know, developer friendly, something that, uh, that I thought would be of general interest to the audience. So I'm going to talk about, you know, a couple of lines of research work uh, that um, both my, my co-founder, Amit Tallwalker, and, and a bunch of our collaborators have been working on, as well as some stuff that, that Amit and I did around sort of scaling up uh, uh, deep learning. And so uh, hopefully you guys will enjoy it. Uh, it's, uh, it, it should be a fun one. So the title of the talk, uh, Taming Large-Scale Deep Learning, I'm sure you all saw that. Uh, and so, you know, uh, why, why are we here? Why do, what do we care? Why do we think that deep learning is important? Well, you know, we've all read sort of the, the, the front page of a bunch of the, these newspapers, and we're seeing these incredible applications that we thought of as science fiction like five years ago uh, coming to the forefront. So, you know, autonomous vehicles are driving around the streets down here. I'm a little scared of that, but okay. Uh, we've got these, uh, these speech-driven interfaces that, that have come into our daily lives from Siri to Alexa and so on. Uh, massive improvements on, on machine translation, and a lot of this is fueled by these new technologies that we all know. Uh, now, we, we think that this, there's really this untapped uh, potential for a lot of further advances. We really think that every industry can be impacted and, and influenced uh, by embracing these technologies and, and using them. But you know, it's, it's really hard. It's really hard to build deep learning powered applications, and I think we all know this. Uh, so we've got these complex workflows, and, and everybody's workflow is a little different, but I'm going to try and distill what we think of as a, as a canonical deep learning application development workflow. So before you do anything, of course, you've got to think about your problem as an ML problem, as an AI problem. You've got to set uh, up an optimization problem that you want to go solve with a mathematical objective. So that's sort of table stakes. But once you've done that, you've got the, the math kind of set up, and you kind of know what you, you want to go optimize. Now we collect our data. So we, this might be data that we go collect as, as a byproduct of our business. Uh, this guy, Paul Kedrowski, used to call this data exhaust. Uh, and, and it might be search logs or something that, I, that I'm getting by running my search engine. But it might be something that I have to go pay for. I've got to go pay some data provider, or I've got to pay some humans to go label it, that sort of thing. Then I'm going to choose my favorite architecture for the task that I'm, I'm solving. So this might be you know, a, a CNN for some computer vision problem. It might be some LSTM if I'm doing text modeling, uh, whatever. So pick one that's appropriate for the problem you're trying to go solve. And then we get to training. And training takes a long time. And you know, we've got great tools like TensorFlow, Keras Cafe, et cetera, that help us declare our models and, and train them. Um, um, and, but within this, we've got a couple of subtasks. It's not this monolith. We have training the models and, and actually getting them to converge. And this might take days on our GPUs. Uh, and uh, oftentimes, we're dealing with things like downsampling that, that might help us tackle the complexity of training. We might say, take 10% of our data and train a model just to get a sense of whether I've got signal or not before, of course, scaling up to the whole thing. And then never is it the case that the first model I tried uh, is the thing that works. I've got this process of hyperparameter tuning. I've got to fiddle with the knobs associated with my model, you know, things that might affect the, the model architecture itself, the number of filters in my convolutional layers, or the number, the depth of the model, or, or so on, or things that might affect the, the actual learning objective, the regularization, and so on. Um, and so I've got to fiddle with the knobs for a while, and, and then finally I'm done. Uh, well, no, it's going to take me weeks to, to do this, and it's a, a manual and opaque process. And then I've got to refine, and I've got to iterate. So uh, it's never the case that that, that first model is, is you know, statistically su sufficient. If it is, I probably would have been able to solve, uh, solve my problem with a lot simpler methods. And so I might go back and decide I need to collect new data or different data. I might have to choose a different architecture. And I've got to put on sort of my ML modeler hat for this piece of the, the workflow. Underneath all of this, we have a bunch of complexity to deal with, right? So we have data management issues. We have cluster management issues on the data management side. Big data sets are the fuel for these models, right? So we've got multi-terabyte data sets often, sometimes even bigger. We also have this data management problem around what models have I even tried in the past, on what versions of what software and, and, and things of this nature, where we think of this as sort of experimental metadata that we're often not capturing or not capturing through very explicit processes. Again, on the, on the other side of things, you know, we, we might be scaling up to uh, beyond sort of the GPUs on my laptop or, or a rack somewhere to many GPUs across a cluster. And I've got to manage these resources. They're expensive. Increasingly, you know, NVIDIA will sell you one box filled with GPUs that's, that costs $150,000. That's getting to the cost of one developer for a year. And, and once you factor in power and maintenance, it starts to be really expensive. And so if these resources are sitting idle, we start to feel really bad about ourselves as, as developers and making, wanting to make sure that they're doing useful work. 
Uh, further, it's, it's hard to get these GPUs to, to train together in parallel and make progress faster than I could with, with sort of a single device, and I'll talk about that more in sort of the, the latter half of the talk. So I get through training, and I've done this iterative process, and I've developed my ML application, and now I've got to worry about deploying it in production. And I was just talking to uh, Bino here in the front, front row, and, and we were kind of talking about this problem. And you know, it's often the case that the people developing, uh, developing our models, our, our ML researchers and, and engineers, aren't really thinking about deployment time constraints when they're thinking about model development. They're thinking more about, uh, how do I get the best possible accuracy on this computer vision task? Uh, and, and not realizing that, oh, I've got to build a model that, that runs in front on an iPhone 7 in under 100 milliseconds or something like that. And so oftentimes we get this, this gap between finishing, thinking we're finished training our model and getting it ready to, for deployment where we've got the job of some poor deployment engineer who has to go in and, and drop a bunch of weights or compress the model in some way before we're actually ready to service it as part of our application. Uh, and so you know, we think uh, that, that it's pretty important to start thinking about these things at design time. Uh, further, we've got very ad hoc processes around how do we make sure our models are actually working in practice? Uh, you know, how do we monitor them? How do we decide when it's time to retrain them, redeploy them? How do we version them and, and so on in production? So hopefully I've convinced you that there's a ton of problems you know, start to finish in, the, in this entire model development life cycle. And tonight, uh, I'm going to spend a lot of time just talking about training. And I want to you know, make the point that while I'm talking about training, there's, there's a bunch of interesting problems to, to worry about you know, before and after training as well. So uh, first, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend some time on this hyperparameter optimization problem. And I'm going to present to you uh, some work from my co-founder, Amit Talwalker, and, and a bunch of other co collaborators uh, called Hyperband. And if you're a practicing data scientist, machine learning engineer, and hyperparameter tuning is a pain for you, this is work that I think you will, you will find really interesting and exciting. It's a, it's a novel algorithm inspired by some work that Amit and I did way back in kind of 2013 uh, that he and, he and others have really taken you know, an, a very impressive and, and beautiful theoret theoretical lens to understanding. Uh, so let's start with a little bit of motivation here. So, Let's, let's really put the cost of deep learning into, into focus. So this is a recent paper from, uh, from uh, a friend of ours at, at Google, Denny Britz, an old collaborator of, my, collaborator of mine, actually, who works on Google Brain. And uh, this is about Google's neural machine translation uh, work. And so they have, this is a single application translating, uh, getting a state-of-the-art translator from English to German. This is a really important task. I'd, I'd like to be able to you know, have the babble fish in my ear and have it be really good. And so uh, I think this is, a, this is a useful application. But uh, just around hyperparameter tuning and trying a bunch of models out and getting these knobs just right so that they could get state-of-the-art performance, they, Google spent 250,000 GPU hours on this problem. And to put that into Amazon dollars, Amazon will charge you about 90 cents an hour for these, uh, for these GPUs on the cloud. And so, 225K to train a single application. And that's just with GPU time. That's not the human time. That's not anything else. That's kind of the stakes of, of what we're talking about here. And that's one application. And you know, one you know, few months of research. And this, they're Google. They can do that. They've got all the money in the world. But for most organizations, that's, that's, a, that's a hard thing. And so one question is, is can we improve this by you know, some, hopefully, an order of magnitude or more? And so let's, let's talk about this hyperparameter optimization problem in more depth. So I'm going to start with a data set. In this case, you know, our favorite uh, uh, computer vision data set, MNIST, recognizing digits. And I've got some model architecture. This model architecture is something that I might have you know, pulled out of Jan LeCun's tech, textbook or whatever. Uh, but this thing has a bunch of assumptions embedded in it. So it has these parameters that affect the architecture of the model, uh, the activation functions that you choose to use, the number of uni hidden units, uh, units in each layer, the number of hidden units, and regularization uh, is another parameter that we might want to tune. And this, is, this is really meant to be an illustrative example. As we get to bigger and more complex models, the number of parameters goes up, and, and the curse of dimensionality really starts to kill us. So the model space is defined by these hyperparameters. And you know, one particular setting is you know these knobs. Okay, so this is meant to look like an old, uh, old you know, uh, audio kind of uh, piece of audio equipment where I'm messing with the dials to get the sound just right, as Alexi did for us earlier in the in, in the evening. Uh, and so we've got one one particular setting of uh, these hyperparameters. And I'm going to feed this in uh, with my training data set to our favorite black box solver, call it TensorFlow or whatever. And I'm going to get some model out f hat. That is the sort of you know converged uh, model here uh, for for that particular setting of the hyperparameters, 
And then I'm going to feed a validation set that I haven't uh, seen in, at training time through my model f hat. And I'm going to get some notion of predictive error. And so this is the thing that I want to do. So I've got 95% you know, uh, accuracy or so for this particular setting of my knobs, or 5% error, uh, on this, uh, this particular training set. And now you know, the task is let's enumerate a, lots of, a lot of different settings of these knobs and pick the best one that I can find, right? So one with maybe 2% error. And uh, the question is, how do I do this as few times as possible with as few resources as possible to get to a good answer quickly? So we want to efficiently identify these high quality hyperparameters. That particular setting that gave me the, the least errors is what we call high quality. And so we measure efficiency in the, uh, Amit and others measure efficiency in this work uh, through uh, a quantity of resources consumed. So how many GP GPU hours do I spend? How much wall clock time is going into these things? How many dollars maybe am I spending on Amazon uh, in order to get these, these numbers? And quality is going to be a user-defined quantity, in this case predictive error, but it could be anything depending on your model. And, and anything is, is a little bit vague, but I'll, I'll get to that. So existing methods for hyperparameter optimization uh, fall into broadly two camps. So first is, is uh, some kind of random search that doesn't really pay attention to the structure of our hyperparameter space. So in this case, you, you look at random search as a, a, we, look at, we think of hyperparameter space as this kind of um, two-dimensional uh, uh, kind of co contour plot here where the colors represent maybe our, our quality metric. And so the goal is to find the things that are, that are as good as possible, in this case, bright red. And what we're going to do is sample randomly from this space. And grid search kind of looks like this, a little bit different. But you, you kind of get the idea. And so we're going to just run a bunch of models to convergence and then find the ones that look best. Adaptive methods, things like Bayesian optimization, are, uh, are what they sound like. They're adaptive. So they might start by sampling a few uh, points from the space and start to develop some idea of what the, what the surface looks like. And then with that information, start to sample points that are kind of closer to something we might consider a global optimal, things that, that look better. And over time, they, they end up finding you know, the, these uh, uh, good areas in, in ways that are hopefully better than what we get out of random. So kind of adding some formalism to this, we're going to assume that a, that a problem has D hyperparameters and that we're able to sample up to N hyperparameter configurations. And so there's really kind of two cases that, that are important here. So one is a case where N, the number of, of samples we get to take, the number of hyperparameter configurations we get to try, is exponential with regard to our dimensionality. And in this case, we can say nice things theoretically about the performance of random search. So we can, uh, with uh, enough hyperparameter uh, configurations, we can kind of cover, cover the space and get a good, good sense of things. And uh, it turns out that in this regime, adaptivity, uh, uh, adaptive methods for this uh, work really, really well. Now, there's another case that I, I would argue is much more important as we start thinking about applying these cases to deep learning, is that n is linear in d. So if, I've, uh, if it's going to take me a day or a week or, or longer even sometimes to sample a, a particular uh, point in the hyperparameter space, and I have these deep learning models that have tons of hyperparameters associated with them, 50, 100, sometimes more, I'm probably not going to get that many shots at goal. I'm not going to get to sample that many uh, uh, different hyperparameters. And I'm certainly not going to get to do it exponential with the number of, of, of hyperparameters that I have. So in this case, we can say theoretically, we can talk about how random do does, and we, we say that it doesn't cover the space. Uh, it also limits adaptivity. Ap adaptive methods really struggle in this regime. So that's not good. So this is, as I've said, becoming increasingly common as we uh, start thinking about this with respect to deep learning. And so the, the key idea with, behind Hyperband is this insight that maybe we can, in some way, downsample the, uh, the, the amount of work we do for a, for a given problem to evaluate more hyperparameter configurations on the same budget. So that's the sort of key insight behind the algorithm. And the way we, we, we leverage a special property of deep learning models that allows us to do that, and that is that many of these learning algorithms are iterative. So we can often check our progress with these algorithms kind of partway through their execution and decide kind of early whether or not we're going to continue devoting resources to them. So let's make that a little bit more concrete. Uh, yeah? Maybe a too early to ask, but in this whole scenario, there are companies like Sigma that do all the things you're describing. What are your thoughts on 
Yeah, so I think there are a lot of... Sure, absolutely. So the question was, there are these companies like SigOpt that do a lot of this uh, kind of thing uh, in order to solve these problems. Uh, I won't say anything about SigOpt. We haven't compared to them directly. I will say that a lot of these companies uh, do uh, focus on this adaptive uh, kind of methods that I talked about, which uh, is, is di more difficult to, to use in the setting where, as I mentioned, D is, is uh, kind of limited, um, uh, or N is limited by D. Um, so I, I, you know, we have a bunch of empirical, empirical work uh, comparing to Bayesian methods uh, for these po problems, and we tend to do pretty well. Uh, and I'll show a, a little preview of that uh, later, and I can point you to some blog posts and papers uh, if you like. So uh, let's take this idea of downsampling iterations. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not from ML. Uh, I know nothing about it, but uh -huh. I'm trying to understand what the problem is. Uh -huh. So, OK, so from my understanding, and I want you to confirm if that's correct, we are trying to optimize a problem with d number of variables and finding a value for all d of them. That is the optimum, right? That, that gets us somewhere close to the global optimum. Yep, uh, and importantly, we can't. We don't know very much about the function mapping d to this uh, this target quality. So we can't take derivatives necessarily. We can't use kind of traditional a lot of traditional uh, opt optimization methods. We're kind of in this black box setting, and so we open up the black box a little bit, as I'll uh, as I'll show you here. And so the the idea is that. Um, you know these algorithms are iterative. So it's if you if you've run you know uh, uh, machine learning models in in practice before, you you get tools like TensorBoard that might show you something like this: the number of iterations that your model has run for versus the predictive error of that model. And you'll see that you know in the, in this particular illustration, these things are are uh, are decreasing mostly, and they kind of converge towards some global, uh, hopefully some global optimum. And in this graph, you can think of each line as a, as a hyperparameter configuration, so one configuration of these d variables. Uh, and uh, and you know, we would want to find the thing that minimizes this predict predictive error. So in this case, it's the red line that, that gets there at the bottom. Purple is pretty good, blue is pretty good, and then the stuff on the top, not so good. And so the way we think about this is we say, you know, really, the, the, the stuff at the top right here, that's really wasted iterations. That's work that I shouldn't have done because I'm just training, throwing away GPU hours at models that are never going to get better than, than sort of the things at the bottom here. And so uh, that's, that's sort of the key insight that we, that we leverage uh, in, in the, when we use this algorithm hyperband. Uh, and so really that we, you know, the idea being that we should focus our effort here on training models that, that might get, get us better uh, predictive error. And it would be great to know, to know the shape of these curves ahead of time, but of course we can. And so one, one obvious thing that I ask myself as an engineer every time I, I see a new algorithm is what could possibly go wrong with this? Like there's, there's got to be a bunch of issues. So there are, uh, we can talk about these things in mathematical terms. So we can say that these sequences could be non-monotonic. So they might not strictly decrease over time. So my, my training loss uh, might kind of bounce around a little bit. It's not always going down. And they might also even be non-smooth. They might bounce around a lot. So they might, th these curves in practice might look something more like this than, uh, than what I just showed you. And there, you know, obviously, there's a lot of noise kind of early on in the process before I get signal later on. And so one of the key research questions that was asked in this paper was, how can we safely discard a, a configuration? And so uh, Amit and, and, and others spent a bunch of, of time and spilled a bunch of ink uh, understanding this from the context of a active learning. So they generated a new no novel downsampling approach uh, to kind of safely make this explore versus exploit uh, kind of trade-off. Uh, it leads to state-of-the-art empirical performance. So you know, run on hundreds of data sets and tens of different model architectures and so on. Uh, it really you know, does a lot better than, than these uh, uh, adaptive uh, methods, which were previous state-of-the-art. It's also got this nice uh, set of properties that in a lot of ways it's provably correct. Uh, and, uh, and so let's, let's take a look at what you know, a, a typical result might look like uh, in this space. So, Say the task is we want to do hyperparameter tuning on, an, on a neural network. And it's a four layer convolutional net, neural network on this CIFAR 10 data set that is kind of a classic uh, a data set that people use for uh, classifying tiny images. Uh, the network itself has eight hyperparameters that, that we want to tune over, and it's for image recognition. 
And so kind of the classic method, the, the sort of easiest method that you would pick for this problem is, is random search. And over some number of iterations, random might look like this. Obviously, there's no labels on the y-axis. This is really meant to be illustrative. An adaptive method usually gets to a, a better answer somewhat faster. So you know the adaptive methods are actually doing their job. But what we see with hyperband is often a curve that looks like this. And this has been borne out over and over again. And the real, you know, the reason for this, this uh, uh, to happen is that we're able to consider a lot more configurations in a shorter period of time than we are with the adaptive methods. So the adaptive methods run these models all the way out to the right edge of these curves and then, and then make some decision. Uh, hyperband kind of very quickly throws away things that are, that are not looking good. And so empirically, the speed ups tend to be around 50 times faster than, than random with, with hyperband in terms of number of resources consumed, about 10x faster th over adaptive. It also has this nice property where it's a nicely, par easily parallelizable algorithm. So you can throw it at a lot of GPUs in parallel, and it's, and it's happy to keep going. Uh, it often leads to much lower final, final error uh, in, in empirical uh, settings and, and much lower variance than you get with these existing methods. So in, in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's a lot better. And so then the, the question is, is what, what can we say theoretically about the performance of this algorithm? And so this was really, I think, where uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the, you know, kind of academic heavy lifting uh, happened. And I, I, I uh, take no credit for this, this at all. Uh, but uh, the authors frame this as a, a multi-armed bandit problem. So if, for those of you not familiar, multi-armed bandits is this idea that you walk into the casino and there are 100 slot machines on the floor. And you know ahead of time, some of these slot machines are going to be paying out at a higher rate than others, but you have no idea which ones. And so multi-armed bandits is a way of, of analyzing what's a good strategy for what, 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 what should I do? What's a good algorithm to follow to find those, uh, those high-paying slot machines as quickly as possible? And so there's this nice theoretical framework around this, uh, around regret minimization. And so uh, by framing this as a best arm identification problem, uh, we can ask things like, given n configurations, how many resources should we uh, should be required to find the best one? Uh, and there are a lot of other kind of cute results that can come out of this. So with that, I'm I'm going to switch gears away from hyperparameter optimization. I think you know if those if if those of you if some of you got really excited about that, I'm happy to point you to papers and 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 talk about it. And now I'm going to switch much more to sort of the systemsy side of the th uh, of the shop. Do you want questions? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So. I mean, what, what you explained made a ton of sense. I just, there's one thing I had a question about. Uh -huh. Was it directly addressed by your slot? Sure. So quite often when you're doing this kind of um, uh, hyperparameter optimization, you're doing it on a problem that is just a variant of a problem that you've analyzed previously. Uh -huh. So you've done some hyperparameter optimization on similar, but not exactly the same case. Right. Are there any opportunities to leverage what you learned from similar but not the same cases to help guide the optimization process. Sure. So I'll paraphrase the, the question for the video. Uh, so the, the, the question, if I, if I understand it, is you're solving hyperparameter hyper optimization problems, but you're not doing so in, in sort of a vacuum. You've done a bunch of other, th uh, the, the same thing before. Are there opportunities to leverage that data? So I think the answer is absolutely. Uh, and uh, there's a, a subfield called meta learning that, that looks at this particular problem. Um, you know, I think that there's, there's a very natural kind of warm start uh, uh, way you could extend an algorithm like Hyperband to, to leverage that, that previous data. Uh, and the adaptive methods are really good at, at using that sort of prior knowledge to, to uh, give you a, a sense of where to, to sample going forward. Does the hyperband, the, this paper you pointed us to, you talk about that from the start process? Uh, it doesn't directly. I can, I can, I'm happy to talk to you about it offline as well. Uh, yeah? It looks like hyperband can help because it's something the source license yeah, so Hyperband the algorithm is 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 uh, is freely available. There are actually more implementations of it than just the ones created by the authors. So uh, I encourage you to check them out. Uh, we internally at, at Determined AI we have our our own uh, implementation with pr proprietary extensions that we've made uh, since, uh, and uh, you know happy to talk about those as well. Do you know what how AutoML addresses this and how it compares? Yeah, so uh, the question is, is how does AutoML uh, compare to this? So AutoML is really about uh, model architecture search and uh, is kind of a, um, I would say, more focused on the, uh, on 
the fact that we are training deep nets and that, that points in the hyperparameter space are somehow related to each other. So as we grow a deep net by a layer, um, maybe we can leverage something that we knew about the, the slightly smaller network to, to bootstrap our way into, into good performance. That stuff is, is super fascinating. I think it's really, you know, so far the papers you see out of, uh, out of uh, Google and stuff, uh, I mean, the problem that I, I addressed early in the slide where it's like 250,000 GPU hours uh, to, to do a hyperparameter sweep, the numbers I see there are like an order of magnitude or more higher. So uh, actually doing auto ML in practice seems to be a really hard thing. And, and a lot of those tasks are, are frankly pretty trivial so far. I think it's a really exciting avenue of research though. Yeah. So both are advantages typically classified as a discrete problem. Like I pick this one, I pick this one, or pick this configuration. Mm -hmm. uh, deep learning is often optimized in continuous space. Yeah. So how can you make a theoretical guarantee of the best single parameter given a continuous space? I can understand bounded parameters but saying a single best parameter in a continuous state, state search seems a little dubious. Yeah, so we, uh, we typically are, are analyzing these things with bounded parameters rather than, than in infinite ones. There are uh, some... Even within the bounds, I mean, like, with, I mean like, a, like a range. Yeah, yeah, so there are some continuous extensions to the classical multi-arm bandit stuff that, that are, are leveraged by this work. Uh, I'd be happy to, to set you up with my collaborators to, to talk in, about that in more detail. Sort of related to that, uh, given these end configurations, what's the approximate complexity of the algorithm to find the best one, or is that a non-issue? Uh, the approximate complexity of the algorithm to find the best n, I mean, it, it's basically linear with with d, uh, so it's it's pretty uh, pretty reasonable. Um, cool, uh, awesome. Um, so. Great. Uh, if there are no more questions about hyperparameter optimization, and I, I think it's a really exciting topic too, uh, I'll switch to uh, kind of the distributed training part of the, the talk. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, this, this uh, paper we wrote called Paleo, and this one I actually helped write, so I I'm, I'm, uh, uh, feel a little bit more, more comfortable uh, uh, directly answering questions on it. Uh, but uh, uh, this is, again, uh, with my, my co-founder, Amit Talwalker, uh, who's, uh, who's both with the company and a, and a machine learning uh, professor at CMU, uh, as well as uh, Hanke, who's a, who's a computer vision student at UCLA, um, uh, who's, who, who honestly did a lot of the sort of nitty gritty, really hard, uh, hardcore work here. Um, so uh, Paleo is this performance model for deep networks. And the, the kind of birth of Paleo was uh, kind of, again, picking on our friend Denny Britz here. Uh, it was really birthed out of this, this idea that you know, hey, it's, it takes, you know, oftentimes days or weeks to train a single model out to convergence. And I would love to be able to throw more than one GPU at my problem to, to uh, train my models faster. It seems like parallel computing is, is, is a very natural way to solve these problems. And so let's, let's ask ourselves, uh, you know, is, that, is this even a, a, a reasonable thing to do? And so the idea was, okay, combine this deep learning with parallel distributed training, throw a bunch of computers at a problem, and take, it, take us from weeks to, to you know, just a few minutes to train our models, and, and we should all be able to make a lot more progress, uh, right? And so uh, Amit and I started looking at this question uh, four, almost five years ago at this point. And so we were at Berkeley working on uh, MLlib uh, in Apache Spark. And uh, you know, we built a bunch of the standard sort of textbook machine learning algorithms, your SVMs, your logistic regression, your ALS, you know, and so on in, into that system. And you know, the next question everybody started asking us was, where's the neural nets? Where's the deep learning? And so uh, we were sitting pretty close to the cafe guys and started talking to Evan Shell Shellhammer and a bunch of other folks uh, on, uh, working on that project about how do we, you know, how do we merge these things? How, we, how do we put um, you know, deep learning and Spark together? And, and it feels like a peanut butter and jelly situation, right? Um, so we, we sat down and we kind of did some back of the envelope uh, training on the, what were then the state of the art uh, uh, models at the time. So we, we looked at AlexNet and GoogleNet and we said, okay, let's, let's take like, the first thing you would do to parallelize training of these models, uh, in, in specifically data parallel distributed SGD. And uh, we said, okay, how, can we, how, how much could we possibly hope 
to speed this up. This is before we ever did any implementation. We wanted to get a sense of, of how, how much uh, bang for the buck would we get out of here. And we really saw some mod modest estimated speed ups here. So I think the numbers, at, you know, at that time we were thinking throw, you know, 100 GPUs at the problem and we'd get at most like a 3, 4x speed up, which seemed like kind of disappointing. You, you seemed like a waste of electricity, particularly in the context of hyperparameter tuning that's pleasantly parallel and all that. So then in the intermediate time, there have been six distributed deep learning uh, libraries just on Apache Spark that, that have come out. And so these are things from some of our close uh, friends and collaborators, things like SparkNet, things from commercial companies, you know, Cafe on Spark and others. Uh, and so we kind of said, what did we get wrong here? And, and started sc scratching our heads. You know, if these things are, are really, uh, you know, people are investing resources in building these systems, maybe we, should, we, we missed the boat on this one. And so we've also seen distributed deep learning start to take off in general. So uh, TensorFlow has distributed deep learning. Uh, it's it's kind of hard to use, but but you can you can build it right. You can use uh, per, you can build your own parameter servers and pin your variables to the right places, and 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 it, it actually works. And I've built I've built stuff uh, in it before. MXNet is similar, uh, and and you know the blog posts that come out of these these big companies that, that are developing these these pieces of software are, are making some pretty big claims. So TensorFlow, they say we see a 56x speed up uh, in throughput training throughput for inception on 100 GPUs. So not quite linear speed ups, but a lot better than the 5x that we kind of estimated uh, 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 way back when. Uh, MXNet, they say 109x speed up for uh, inception on 128 GPUs. So pretty close to linear speed ups. That's, uh, so, you know, is, is that good? And so uh, we said, okay, let's, let's take that back to the envelope math that we did before, uh, where we decided, you know, I don't think we could really get much from parallelizing AlexNet, and turn it into an analytical performance model to systematically study how distributed deep learning should work in, from a perspective of scalability and performance. And so, uh, you know, there are kind of two main axes here. That we that we're interested in. So one is the computationally the computational platform. So what type of GPUs do I have? What kind of network is connecting these GPUs? What about the uh, the uh, uh, topology of that network? Maybe there's there's some uh, communication patterns that that make these things better. And so you know one configuration might be okay. I've got an AlexNet. Should I train it on 32 EC2 GPUs? How much time and money is it going to take to 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 do that? Uh, versus 16 GPUs versus 64, and, and how do I understand sort of this space? And then the other question you might want to ask is for a fixed architecture, so I've already bought you know, a bunch of GPUs from NVIDIA and I've got them running in my data center, uh, and I've got you know, kind of a, a fixed, uh, uh, sorry, th that, that was sort of the first question. The second question is for a fixed architecture, what platform should we use? So uh, I have you know, an AlexNet, which that's, that's one question, right? The second question is then uh, the converse. For a fixed platform, so I've bought my GPUs, which architecture should I use? Which architecture is going to be most efficient? So is it an AlexNet? Is it a network and network? Is it Inception for training in, in kind of a distributed fashion? If I, they all get pretty close for, uh, uh, in terms of statistical accuracy, maybe I just want the thing that's going to train the fastest on my data. Um, and so then, uh, you know, obviously, you know, you would like to sy sort of systematically explore this design space and find the thing that's going to, you know, give you answers faster, cheaper, et cetera. So the high-level stra strategy uh, when we built Paleo was to say, let's take an architecture, take a model architecture <coughs> that is, you know, AlexNet or ResNet or something like that, and say that this thing provides a declarative specification of the computation that we want to perform. So it is, uh, it is you know, a description of, that, of exactly that. And we want to then map this computation to a specific choice of, of computational platform. So take as input our network architecture and a, uh, a particular configuration of GPUs and network connecting them and so on, and come up with a model for execution time or memory or, or energy consumption or so on. The details here are, are quite tricky. Uh, so you know, it, it might be that, that a particular operation in your ConvNet has a number of different implementations. So if you're doing convolutions, say, you know, uh, they're in the name of convolutional neural network, so they must be a pretty important operation. There, it turns out there are like a half dozen different ways that you can actually execute a convolution. And depending on sort of the size and shape of the convolutions, things like uh, uh, matrix multiply might be the right thing to do, or fa uh, fast Fourier transform, 
or, or so on. And uh, frameworks like QDNN will actually make these choices for you dynamically at, at runtime. So figuring out you know, which, exactly which uh, implementation of these things is going to be run sort of automatically ahead of time is, is kind of a, a tricky problem. There's also, uh, uh, we also want to figure out a way to estimate how much network communication is going to happen when we're doing model updates if we're training our, our, our models in parallel. And so this is, uh, you know, okay, we kind of know that the number of parameters in the model is a good way of, of counting that, but there might be different communication strategies that we, we decide to employ. Uh, it, it's also the case that every deep learning framework is not created equal. So TensorFlow, you know, when it first came out, had this reputation of being slow relative to you know a bunch of the other ones. Since uh, since uh, it first came out, that gap is closed. But some network, some architectures are faster, or some software frameworks are faster than others. And so when we're developing a, a model for execution time, we kind of have to have a, a software specific factor in there to kind of. Uh, 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 pad this estimate and help us get something that is that is more representative of reality. And so there's a bunch more details uh, available in our paper from from iClear last year. Uh, um, you know, encourage you to check it out if you, if you have more questions here. But but let's talk through a couple of examples. So first example is this AlexNet model, uh, and so this is the one that we started to look at five years ago, and we said, okay, let's fix the batch size as we scale up to more workers. So at the time, it was you know folklore that you couldn't train AlexNet with batch sizes over 128. It would not converge, okay? And that was kind of what everybody told us in the vision community who tried this over and over again. And so the other kind of property of this is that as you start scaling to more workers, you're doing exactly the same com computation from a, from a um, kind of uh, analytical perspective. You're, you're scaling up number of workers from one to you know, 100, and your effective batch size remains the same, meaning that you get the same answer as you would if you had run on, on just a single machine. And so I think that's pretty important, and, and we'll come back to that in a little while. But the point here is as you go distributed, you wouldn't and if you're if you're worried about analyzing these things, you, it, it's kind of a nice property to maintain that uh, that we get the same output as serial execution. And so we model this out to up to 128 NVIDIA K80s. We, you know, the fastest network you can get on EC2, 20 gigabit per second Ethernet. Uh, we're taking a data parallel approach to, to training the models. And the, in this case, we're modeling TensorFlow with a batch size of even up to 2048. So, so being generous uh, and saying, well, if you could train up uh, on a batch sizes up to 2048 with AlexNet, what kind of speed ups would you get? And you know the answer here was something around 5x. So with uh, a, a provably optimal communication strategy, butterfly all reduce uh, with uh, with up to 32 workers. That's that's the best speed up we get on this particular thing, at least according to our model. Uh, and I, I'll point out here as well that you know other communication strategies will take you you know do decently well up to maybe four workers, but then they kind of deaden out. And what you see, what kind of an interesting thing that that you see here is that. Uh, you get scalability up to a certain point, and then actually communication starts to dominate the time spent in, in uh, computation, and so that's hence the, di the diminishing right sides, sides of the curves. So really finding that sweet spot is, is, is a hard challenge, and, and it, again, it varies based on the hardware you're running, the network you're running, and, and so on. So then we said, okay, well, what happens if we look at this from the perspective of weak scaling? So let's el eliminate that pesky batch size thing, uh, having to remain fixed as we add multiple workers. So we're going to fix a constant workload for, per worker, you know, a certain number of, of, of items that we're, that we're looking at every time we train, and uh, increase the number of workers linear to, to, uh, uh, linearly. And so again, we scale up to 128 K80s, same, same setup otherwise, but uh, with just 32 examples per worker as part of the, this strategy. And what we see is, hey, we get pretty close to, to linear speed ups. But I, I, I want to stress that the workload here is changing. So that thing that I'm running on the right side of the curve is not the same thing as the thing that I'm running on the left side of the curve. And you know, empirically, we don't think that the models on the right side are going to actually converge uh, to useful answers. In fact, only the things kind of in the lower left corner are going to converge. So that's a little unfortunate. Uh, and so I, I just want to point out that all of these numbers are estimates. So if you were to build a system that looked like this, how would it perform? That's, that's our best estimate. So now let's compare that to systems that people actually built. 
So the first one is, is a TensorFlow uh, blog post. And this is from a couple of years ago. Derek Murray at Google uh, uh, posted this. He leads a lot of the open source work on distributed TensorFlow. It's, it's great stuff. Um, and they, they say, OK, here's an Inception v3 architecture. We're going to have 100 K, uh, NVIDIA K20s, this kind of uh, interconnect between them. And we've got a parameter server approach to uh, uh, model communication and so on. And uh, so the paleo estimates uh, kind of vary based on the communication strategy we use. And we think that uh, uh, parameter server s comes somewhere likely between uh, this tree all reduce and, uh, and a one to all kind of communication strategy. And we see that, that our estimates uh, scale pretty well with, with uh, what they report in this TensorFlow blog, blog post. Again, we're getting pretty close to linear speed ups, but uh, this is with strong scaling, so, or with weak scaling. That is, we're increasing the batch size with the number of, of workers in our cluster. And so it's not clear to me that, that uh, it, would be really, it would have been really nice in this blog post if they had also shown convergent plots alongside, uh, alongside their timing estimates. So time to getting a, a model that actually gets to a certain level of performance and so on. They didn't do that. Uh, but we do a pretty good job of, of guessing how long it's going to take them to, to run this particular workload in, in, in their system. The next example is this uh, is, is kind of a more exotic thing. So just to kind of show you that this model is a little bit versatile. So there's this great paper from uh, Alex Krzyzewski, creator of AlexNet from 2014, where he's talking about not how to parallelize uh, model training across many computers, but many GPUs on the same computer. So up to eight GPUs. And he has this kind of cute uh, trick where he recomputes things on, on certain GPUs to save communication bandwidth. Uh, and so it's this kind of hybrid mode. Uh, it's, it's, again, weak scaling, but, but Alex can get away with it. Uh, so the one weird trick set up, uh, the reported results with this. Paleo, we, we were actually able to uh, um, uh, pretty closely estimate uh, the kind of speed ups that, that Alex got by, by doing this one weird trick thing. Uh, but I, you know, the, the other nice, useful thing about Paleo is that we're able to now compare what if, uh, how much, how much, how worth it was it for Alex to do all this work and come up with this clever new idea? And it turns out it was kind of worth it. So uh, in, at the limit, we see in the lower right-hand corner here, uh, he took what we would estimate to be a 24-hour uh, kind of train time for his particular model with uh, eight GPUs, uh, with just kind of a, a vanilla data parallel setup, down to uh, we would estimate about 14 hours. And in reality, it took him about 16 hours. And so that's a real savings, you know, something like a 33% increase in throughput. And that's that's uh, that's no joke. He, you know, it's really uh, it's a useful uh, it, it's a useful thing that he did here. But being able to say was, it, was this work worth it ahead of time, I think even Alex would have appreciated that. So the t key takeaways from Paleo is that we're able to uh, efficiently and accurately explore the design space of, of model architectures and computing platforms. So help you say for a given model pick the best uh, uh, right number of EC2 nodes to use or whatever. Uh, and we're, I, I would also point out that we should all be very careful about considering this, this notion of strong or weak scaling uh, with respect to, to uh, evaluating these systems in the context of deep learning. A lot of the, the reported results are on weak scaling. And, and I just want to stress that that workload is, is quite a bit different than, than the strong scaling one. And I think it's, it's on us as a community to start demanding that people also put convergence time plots and final accuracy uh, plots on their, on their, uh, uh, in their papers when they're describing these systems. And I think, you know, on a positive note, I think uh, Paleo can really help us develop architectures, new uh, neural network architectures, and learning methods that have nice, favorable kind of computation commu communication profiles, things that will do a better job of training in a distributed fashion and get to good results faster. So leveraging this tool, we think, is, is super useful. Uh, so Paleo, uh, we've got a demo of it available online if you want to you know, mess around with a few different uh, model architectures and, and uh, different assumptions around how fast is my network, what kind of GPUs do I have. It, too, is open source. So if you want to use this to you know, extend to your favorite architecture or, or make some different assumptions, feel free to go ahead and fork the code, send us a PR. Uh, and, uh, and so anyway, t take a look. So just to, just to revisit the sort of beginning of this talk, I talked about this kind of complex workflow of what does it mean start to finish uh, training all the way down to, uh, you know, from data all the way down to deployment of, of developing a, a machine learning uh, uh, model, a, a deep learning model that we can get out to production. I focused tonight really just on the training bit. 
And you know, as a as a company, and, and this is the the only thing that, that is going to sound anything like a sales pitch, I hope. Uh, we really think that there's this natural separation between what a domain expert, the machine learning modeler, should be doing with their with their time and what they want to be doing, and that's thinking about the domain problem, thinking about the modeling issues. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff underneath it, the system support that is equally important, but something that we think should be owned uh, kind of uh, kind of centrally and, and managed by a system, eliminating a bunch of uh, uh, complexity for, for the end developer. Uh, and so that's the kind of thing that, that we're building at Determined AI. Uh, all right, so thank you. I'm happy to take any more questions about the, the distributed training stuff or hyperparameter tuning or just talk, uh, talk uh, machine learning. Uh, thanks for having me. I hope uh, people enjoyed this. So are you just focused on, uh, are you doing only image classification tests for your architectures or are you doing LP or digital classification? Yeah, so we, we looked at uh, uh, things outside of ConNets when, when we do the architecture uh, uh, evaluation. We looked at things like LSTMs and, and so on. And so the, the tools are, are pretty general in, in, that, in that perspective. They work on RNNs and so on. Uh, we use image classification because that's the, you know, the one that everybody kind of, uh, kind of knows best. Yeah, can you tell us more about the Terminator AI? Yeah, so uh, we build a, uh, a workbench for uh, machine learning engineers and data scientists who are, who are trying to get these d deep learning features into production. Uh, and, uh, you know, the observation is that it takes oftentimes a team of a dozen really smart people with a million dollars in spend in, at NVIDIA uh, two years to get these things shipped, and we want to shrink that time down to weeks or months. That's really what we're, what we're trying to help people with. And so, you know, we're, we're working with teams, you know, anywhere from, you know, call it four or five data scientists up to 20 or 30, cluster sizes from, you know, 40, 50 GPUs all the way up to hundreds uh, in really exciting areas, everything from the life sciences, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals and, and, uh, and uh, gene therapies uh, to things in IoT and, and, uh, and financial services and, and so on. So uh, I think, you know, like I said at the beginning of the talk, there's a really wide array of applications, and I'm excited to, to see uh, which ones uh, are, are most impactful. Sorry, just one follow-up question. Is that like uh, consulting client services or machine learning as a service or open source product? We, so we sell a software platform, uh, you know, you, uh, primarily for folks that have uh, GPUs on-prem. We work in the public cloud, too. So if you've got a bunch of uh, GPU nodes that are sitting there uh, idle and not doing useful work all the time, give us a call. Your paper almost a year ago, so I'm a bit jaded. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> well, failure okay. came out around December of 16. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, you know, just wanted to get your opinion. Where is the trend right now? It seems like there's a lot of innovation also going on in Harvard. Mm -hmm. And there are things like statistical efficiency, hardware efficiency, the um, and in, you know, so is is software optimization gonna have a lot? Yeah. So the I, I think the, the the way I'm hearing the question is, hey, the hardware is getting faster underneath us. Why should I bother? Uh, you know, maybe we're still in the in the Moore's law or something similar to it for this this particular specialized right, application. Communication time, a bunch of things which are sort of being automated. Yeah. Underneath. Yep. Absolutely. So that that stuff is is all proceeding at a at a great and place. You probably know it better than anybody. And I would I would like I would say there are kind of two interesting things here. So first is you look at every new generation of NVIDIA GPUs that come out, and the memory gets bigger and the flops get faster. Do we get like you know do do, do our problems go away? No. The researchers come out with a new, greater, you know, later, greater model that fits on in memory and so on. And it's a version of Parkinson's law, right? Work expands to fill the time allotted. Uh, and so I think that's, that's part of what we're seeing here. The other thing I'd say is that there's really interesting trade-offs that start to happen as the, as the hardware gets faster. So uh, kind of counterintuitively, faster, faster GPUs doesn't actually help my scalability. It actually hurts it. So the communication uh, layers that we have underneath us, the, the speed of light is kind of fundamental. And it's, it's hard to make networking go a lot faster. And so there is a real, I think, opportunity as if we, if we view 
network is basically going to stay fixed for the foreseeable future. A lot of work on algorithm development and thinking hard about how do we how do we do this stuff in a distributed fashion so that we can learn models, you know, in a in a useful amount of time. So that's that's kind of where our our opinion of that. Yeah. I'm not sure I follow the weak scalability versus strong scalability. It seems like you're saying that in the weak scalability scenario, the scalability metrics really aren't meaningful because you're getting a different result that is not as accurate. Yeah, exactly. So, um, What's so, it? so it's, I mean, does that mean it's just a meaningless result? For you? It's, it's not meaningless, right? So weak scalability is really, if, if I've got to do um, batch inference on a trillion uh, on a trillion images. Weak scalability is actually a pretty good way of of analyzing my my system, right? So it there's no there's no relationship between the inference on one one image or another, and spreading those out across a, a, a bunch of machines really will you know in kind of a map reduce fashion uh, I- I increase my throughput, right? The, the issue is that when we're doing the actual training time, we have this communication step that has to happen to coordinate amongst the nodes. And that's where, if I were in traditional convex optimization lab land, I would not care about batch size. I'd say, you know, use whatever batch size you want because I'm always going to converge to the same answer. In deep learning, where uh, unfortunately our batch size is an important parameter controlling the, the speed of our convergence, uh, that's where this, this kind of effect starts to come in. And unfortunately, I don't know of any really good theory that, that relates the batch size to uh, the, the, you know, the error that you get, other than a bunch of empirical observations that say, you make batch size too big and my, mo- my models don't converge. Uh, Jeff Dean, however, uh, gave a talk at SysML, this conference we sponsored a few weeks ago, uh, where he made some hints about maybe they've got that figured out. So watch Google research, and, and, and maybe in a year or so, we'll, we won't have this problem anymore. What do you think of Asian optimization? I think it's a really interesting set of techniques. Uh, as I said, I think it works great in this uh, situation where we can, we can really ha- we can explore a lot of hyperparameter configurations. Uh, I think that in other settings, it, it works sort of uh, less well. And, but I think it's, it's something that could like, actually really be um, complementary to a bunch of the work that I presented. So hyperband, where at every round you do an, a Bayesian sampling step, is a very interesting algorithm. And I know some people who are working on that from a research perspective right now. Great. Thank you very much.